And it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker, is Dr. Paul Yeski. And I think many of us in the room know who he is, but he is a senior member of the veterinary team at the Swine Vet Center, which includes about 15 veterinarians. He's well recognized for his work in disease management and elimination. Um, he did his um, DVM at Iowa State University in 1985. And generally, he's most recently, he's known for his work with on mycoplasma and its elimination from the sow herd. And he enjoys problem solving and making an elimination program into its production system. So I think Paul's talk today on keeping robust sows healthy is another real good um, component of the whole uh, gilt development programs. So thank you, Paul. All right, there we go. All right, <clears throat> well, we're, uh, we're gonna step back into the barn a little bit away from some of the science, so uh, I apologize a little bit for that. But uh, again, the comments that are gonna come today are not from myself alone, but from all of my colleagues at the Swine Vet Center and uh, Swine Vet Center Research, et cetera. So where I'm gonna head uh, this morning with the talk is a little bit on um, the health of the sow herd as a whole. Uh, from the industry side, uh, a little bit of what's happening with mortality, uh, keeping sows healthy, uh, how do we make those successful gilts get into the herd, and then uh, what can we do to be successful. So for me, I, I grew up in the, in the swine industry, uh, did chores back in the 70s, and we had the farmer's hybrid sow, and uh, uh, it really wasn't an issue when you talked about sow longevity and uh, you know you almost had to uh, euthanize that pig if you were going to have any issues. Uh, we had really technical feed distribution and so uh, you can see the precision of how we fed the sows back in those days in the open front. Um, and so again, uh, we don't see these genetics anymore and there's probably a good reason they only had 10 pigs. And so uh, again, that robustness that was there uh, was helpful when we were in those outside conditions, uh, but as we've moved to more productive females, uh, certainly have seen different things. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, uh, having, having the ability here to just look at the industry as a whole and the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Project, if we look at the PERS status, uh, again, I said, uh, uh, I told Bob having the Lehman Conference in, uh, in September is a great time because everything's as quiet as we're going to be and it's only going to get worse. And so uh, you can see here we're on a typical pattern here where there's not much activity through the summer months and we're headed up into that uh, uh, exponential growth or exponential por portion of the curve where we're going to see more outbreaks. Uh, the one thing that does concern me with PERS as an industry, and I think it's a challenge for all of us as we go back home, is to look at, if we look back here in the earlier years of monitoring, uh, we see more of a uh, undulating, the category one are the active infected sows, and so we see that going up and down over time where herds would clean up. And as we look here in the last few years, we see uh, that doesn't really move up and down very much. We're keeping more animals in that uh, category one status where we've got active virus moving in the herds. And so uh, the other side of that coin is the uh, negative, the category four, continues to get smaller as well. So again, those are some challenges, I think, from a purse standpoint. Uh, as Laura said earlier, we look at PED. Uh, certainly back here when PED came into the industry, a lot of activity, uh, and we see little peaks every year along here, generally in the winter months, December, January. And uh, again, we're in that quieter time for that as well. Uh, whoops. When we look at myco, whoops. When we look at mycoplasma, <clears throat> we can see that uh, this is the uh, uh, SDRS data, looking at the uh, percentage of positive her positive samples. Should say not herds, positive samples at the diagnostic labs through the Midwest. We can see that that continues to stay fairly constant, uh, and we haven't seen a lot of movement there. We are seeing more more systems going to negative, uh, making negative pigs and uh, negative herds, and so uh, definitely that trend is uh, certainly heading better. I took some data from a production system, and I'm sorry that the numbers are kind of small, but you'll get the idea from the trend and the chart here. So the colors would go uh, to the category statuses, so red would be purse, purse positive, 
and green would be PERS negative. And so if we look at farrowing rate, being PERS negative is a good thing. We look at total borne, there's really not much difference. First time I looked at it, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Well, it makes sense. It's the born alive that's the issue, the mummies and the stillborns. And when you look at the pre-winning mortality also, that's the big difference. And so that's the impact of that health of the sow herd that's having on the overall productivity as we look downstream. It's not only one area, uh, but uh, it's certainly having an impact. When we look at total mortality as an industry, I think, again, uh, my challenge to the industry is I think there's an opportunity for us to do better. When we look at stillborns and mummies, we're up to 10% pre-winning mortality on the average, and these are some uh, data from Metafarms data. And so 14.1% on pre-winning mortality, uh, nursery uh, in that five, finishing in that five, you add it all up, and only 65% of the pigs are making it uh, from birth to market. And so again, area of opportunity for us. And when we look at their uh, sow mortality of 15.3% as well. And this is a chart I asked uh, Metafarms to put together for me uh, as we were looking at the sow mortality. We go back to 2013, just went back uh, 10 years. And so 8.7% uh, and now we're over 15%. So again, that, that curve is moving up uh, at a faster rate than we'd certainly like to see it. Uh, one of the challenges for those in the industry, this isn't news, but prolapses have certainly been on the move up. <clears throat> we look back here, we're at 2.4, uh, in a particular production system, we were at 2.4%, and uh, uh, four years later, we're at 7.9%. So that number has uh, continued to be one of the headaches that's driven some of the mortality, and certainly an area we have to continue to look at as well. So when we look at uh, the breakdowns of mortality, and uh, I think as the researchers and as uh, producers uh, and all the databases, I'd say this to the databases, is we got way too many reasons for sows to get pulled out that it really doesn't sort good. But when you look at it, you can see prolapses is big, sudden deads, uh, unknowns. So we got a lot of sows dying for uh, sudden deads and unknowns, and then uh, downers and lame. Uh, being the other big ones when we look at the big categories. And I think the interesting thing to me, this chart was looking at removals, and uh, one of the things where I think we're losing out, where we're not retaining these sows, if you look at old age, uh, the percentage of sows called for old age has gone down. Well, why has it gone down? Because they're dying. And so we're not culling the sows for the right reasons, we're culling, we're keeping the survivors. And so, again, opportunity there for us. And when's the sow mortality occurring? Uh, again, the farrowing house, so this is breaking it down by time. So you got the first, second, third trimester farrowing and lactation. 63% of the uh, mortality occurs in lactation. So it's a very short period of time when you think about it. And it's an opportunity for us uh, to certainly, again, focus there. And if we're gonna make big changes back in gestation, it's probably not gonna have a big impact because it's only 22% of the mortality. So we gotta work in the lactation phase or that late gestation uh, lactation phase to make differences. And trying to understand what's going on with that mortality in this particular production farm, we went in to try and break it down and look at it <clears throat> a little more closely. Again, uh, leg injuries and uh, lameness being a significant part of their mortality and so uh, certainly uh, helps you that not all herds are the same. You gotta go look at the information, understand it. While I was preparing these uh, slides for this talk, I went back to uh, one of Dr. Lola's talks back uh, in 2004 and I thought it was kind of interesting. I wanted to put it in here because uh, it's like 10% is way too high. This is a crazy number and now we're averaging 15. So have we made progress? Uh, probably not as much as we should have. And um, <clears throat> back in 2004, uh, Dr. Lola suggested the goal should be, uh, we should be under 5%. And at that time we had herds being able to achieve that. Today that's very difficult to be done. And I think it tells us an area we've got to continue to work on. And so again, what's, uh, what's old is new again. And uh, I, I borrowed these slides from Dr. Rodemaker, uh, where they did a study, where a graduate student did the study where they went and observed sows, 
and implemented treatment based upon seeing the sows uh, not get up and eat. And that a person in the front and the back, and, and I joked with Dr. Rodemaker and said, well, isn't that what they're supposed to do every day? And he said, well, yeah, but we actually did it. And so uh, in the study, what they showed though was a significant reduction uh, in mortality just by identifying those sows, treating them early, and being able to get that number done. And the individual farm, and when they took it system-wide, you can see it was a step change in mortality. So again, showing us that there are interventions that we can do uh, that can help to make, to help improve that uh, performance. <clears throat> so when we talk about observations and we work with the employees on the, on the farms, uh, one of the things is oftentimes people will start here with their walk as they're checking sows, and so you get to this same sows always last. What we try and encourage is to move different ways, different patterns, so you don't always see the animal that's eating first and the animal that's eating last by the time you get there. So you're looking at them at different angles and being able to see them at different times. And so, again, best time is after you drop feed. And uh, lameness certainly being one of the biggest challenges, and uh, what we wanna do is try and find those sows in that early stage of lameness. You can see the sow kind of what we call a toe tapping. You can see she's kind of hunched up a little bit, her back's a little hunched, her legs are a little, front legs are swung out a little bit. <clears throat> and so that's when we want to, that's when we can make some interventions, that's when we can make some differences. I borrowed these slides from Dr. P. Thomas from NPIC, uh, where he talked about uh, the difference in mortality in pens uh, versus stalls. So I think, you know, all of us would say that's certainly a trend as we see more stalls. And then this was looking at uh, health status with epidemic PERS uh, being higher than when we're uh, more of a negative or endemic where we're continuing to keep PERS on site. So again, health status, housing all make a difference. I borrowed uh, one more slide from uh, Tim's slide deck back in 2004. And uh, again, sounds pretty familiar to today, right? Lack of experience and knowledge not raised on a farm and having basic husbandry skills, little to poor training, uh, low unemployment rate, farms understaffed. Not really different, is it, <laughs> than, than what we've got today. So again, what's old is new again, so uh, again, sometimes time is the key. And I thought at the NPIC meeting when they had the sow mortality session, uh, they had a sow retention specialist. And I, I think all of us, uh, and I, I applaud the Iowa Select guys uh, for, for making that move. I think it's a, it's a new role, it's a new way of thinking, and again, I think it's where we need to be going is having someone that focuses on that every day, and that's their job. And this is a model that I put together a number of years ago uh, to try and look at sow retention. And so in this model, uh, we're using 90% retention parity to parity and different selection rates, so from 60% to 45%. And so if you do a 90% retention rate, that's the number of sows you're gonna have in each parity. You can see at a 60% replacement rate, by P5, they're almost all gone. If you're at 45, you're gonna have some P7 pluses, just because of the numbers. And this is if we're at an 80%. I think you said this morning, you guys were at, eight, that when you looked at your data, you were 18%. So this is what it's more looking like. And the math comes back to haunt you. If you don't have at least a 60% replacement rate, you're getting all these old sows. There's no way to get around the math. And those old sows come back to haunt you multiple ways. And so, again, you just got to think about, it's a complex, uh, complex thing where we've got retention and selection are what we're doing for replacement rate. And they're going to vary both ones, and so those variables will move uh, independently. But we have to consider them together. <clears throat> and so this is looking at, uh, again, the percent of the herd and uh, the retention rate over those different parities. If we're doing it right and we're getting out here, we're somewhere, ideally, we'd be north of that uh, 60%. So again, uh, gilts, gilts are key to the robust uh, sow health. Uh, they must enter the herd properly. We have to retain those gilts. If we're just spinning the gilts through, we're just destabilizing the herd as we bring those animals into the herd over time. And it allows us to make those better culling decisions. When we saw the mortality go up, 
we saw the old age calls go down. We're having to keep the survivors. And we want to mount, maintain that downstream flow. If we have more animals circulating through that are younger, we're going to have more health challenges in that flow. <clears throat> so we want to make sure that those gilts are ready to enter the herd, uh, both from a health standpoint, reproductive standpoint, and housing being properly acclimated, uh, acclimatized to, to stalls if we have individual animal stalls so that we can get that maximum performance. And we've seen this chart several times today, and uh, as we see here, you know, the better the sows, or better the gilts do, the better they're gonna do their whole life. And it just continues to show us that. Uh, this is some recent data from 2022. So again, uh, successful gilts have uh, had all their vaccinations at least two weeks ahead of time. Uh, they've had a first heat cycle. We're ideally breeding them on the second heat cycle. Uh, we're at a minimum of uh, 300 pounds and they've had that time to be acclimated to where they're gonna live. If it's electronic feeding, if it stalls, uh, whatever we're gonna need to do. <clears throat> and as Gustavo said this morning, it doesn't come free. Uh, it takes time and effort to get there. And we have to allocate time for these procedures. Uh, unfortunately, I see most farms uh, saying, leaving guilt development to the end of the day. And it's uh, afterthought, and uh, it's always we're in a hurry to get going, and yep, we gotta go take care of the GDU, or yep, we gotta go take care of the acclimation. And so again, I think we have to make it a higher priority, even though we may do it at the end of the day, make sure we continue to keep it a priority. <clears throat> again, um, we don't want the gilts as they come into the herd to upset the health status of the herd, so we don't wanna have animals, uh, we don't want them to be circulating pathogens as they enter, and we don't want to be breeding an animal that's sick. It never goes well. And uh, for anybody that's been through uh, disease challenges and outbreaks, we know that breeding never goes well when the animals aren't feeling good. And we wanna not have that shedding for the downstream flow and the downstream production. And that's where we can oftentimes see the biggest impact is uh, the rest of the production system downstream giving us more headaches. And we gotta remember that <clears throat> the gilts are the largest, if you look at those charts, the gilts are the largest portion of your herd and it's a declining number as we go forward. And so again, it depends upon your replacement rate. If you're at a 65% replacement rate, they're a significant part of your herd and they have to perform well. Or you're gonna, be, or you're gonna have challenges. So how do we get those gilts in? And I just wanted to touch a little bit on the vet to vets. I think they're very common today. Um, certainly at one point in time, Perry, uh, there wasn't very many done. And today it's very common practice uh, but it's very important to have that communication with that source herd. And just gonna go through a few of the highlights. Again, I always like to know uh, what the genetics are on the, on the specific multiplier. Can I get all the genetic lines I want or am I gonna have to go to multiple sites, multiple farms to get it? Do they have teaser bores available? Do I have to uh, make a special order? What are those sort of uh, potentials? <clears throat> What pathogens are the what pathogens is the herd negative for, and how are they routinely monitored? What's the uh, system that they've set up for testing? How often do they have herd visits uh, by uh, either staff veterinarians or uh, outside consultants? And again, uh, how many pigs are they actually looking at? Uh, ideally, if you can get a summary of the health status on some of the monitoring that's been done, is always helpful. Uh, to be able to be able to look at that. Understanding the biosecurity protocols around transport of uh, the isoweens or selects or teaser bores if they come from a different location. And uh, I always like to ask how they get the calls out of that herd just to understand that risk too. And then how are mortalities being disposed of? Does that put me at risk from that multiplication as well? And then the vaccination schedules, what are they doing in the sows, the piglets, the finishers? and then to the selects that are coming my way. And then I always ask, uh, uh, at the end of the call, I always ask, what should I know about the herd? Uh, leave that open-ended question. And uh, again, it needs to be not only a one-time, once you've qualified the multiplication herd, it needs to be an ongoing communication, but that's generally gonna be short and it's generally gonna be about uh, some changes that have occurred over time. So once we got the vet to vet, we got the source, we got the animal, how do we get the gilt into the herd? Again, the isolation, um, if, you've got a, if you've got a gilt developer unit, uh, 
and sometimes we'll have those uh, combined together. But if we talk about mycoplasma, I've spent a lot of my life working on mycoplasma and frustrated with mycoplasma, and the frustration came when we had negative gilts that we brought into positive herds. For uh, years and years, we had positive gilts we brought to positive herds, and it really wasn't a big deal. But uh, I think Dr. Maria Peters and Eduardo Fano put together a real nice chart here. You got a negative gilt, and you want to have a sow that's very low prevalence and not shedding to her piglets, and she's going to go through a positive phase, but we want, by the time we get to farrowing, we want those negative pigs. What we know is it takes 240 days to stop shedding, so we got to work backwards from farrowing. You got the gestation length, you got to go back 126 days, so that means by 84 days of age, they need to be exposed. If they're getting exposed after that, you're not going to have good success in keeping the herd stable. And so if I'm bringing in selects to a mycopositive herd, I'm going to have a challenge in keeping that herd stable. And we know there's lots of different methods to expose these animals. Uh, the cedar model, the nose-to-nose -nose contact, uh, and uh, the uh, intratracheal inoculation. And, and I've done some of these. I'll tell you it's a very good way to get them infected. And I'll tell you, it's a very labor-intense way to get them infected. Uh, I did 1,200 gilts uh, on, on a cleanup project, and by the last pen of gilts, I was crawling from gilt to gilt. So it's, <laughs> trust me, it's not fun. The aerosol exposure certainly has worked very well and certainly has been more uh, adapted today. The fogging method has worked good. It's uh, certainly more friendly from the labor side and from the, from the pig side. And you have to have enough time to establish that immunity, reduce that shedding so that you don't have that impact when those animals come into the herd. And we also want to make sure the gilts are big enough by the time of breeding. So we know that if we are exposing mycoplasma and depurs both, we're going to affect the growth rate. And so there may be, uh, that's where one size doesn't fit all. You can't say breed all the gilts at this age because if I'm exposing to one or the other or both, uh, and it depends upon the strains that I've got for purrs, I may see differences in growth rate and I may have to breed my gilts later. <clears throat> and uh, we talk about the isolation phase, again being that buffer from the source farm, uh, as we talk about uh, why we need to expose and we need that buffer to make sure we don't have uh, that happening. This summer we had a couple farms where we inadvertently got brought into the isolation and that's never fun. And so again, you want to make sure you've got that buffer. You want to make sure we can, uh, and with the filtered farms, we're able to make that buffer be a little bit more realistic. And again, it gives time for uh, issues in transport or changes at the south source farm. And generally, we're looking at a three to four week period. Many farms will test in that first three days after arrival, uh, just to make sure nothing's changed at the source farm using a wide variety of testing methods. Again, that'll de depend upon the herd. And then again, at three to four weeks after the isolation phase, again, doing either all animals or statistical sampling, and it's gonna, monitor, it's gonna depend again on a herd-to-herd -herd basis. And then we have to make sure that that information gets conveyed back to the sow farm so somebody doesn't open the door early or move early. You know, some systems will have a sign-off sheet, some will uh, send an email, text, whatever, uh, but just have to have good communication there to know that everything's passed through the way it's supposed to be. And then we move into what we call the acclimatization phase. Sometimes those are going on simultaneously uh, with the isolation, but if you're doing the acclimation and the, and the uh, isolation at the same time and you've got pathogens you want to monitor, you can't really do it. So generally the acclimation phase follows that. And like we said for mycoplasma, we're talking about a minimum of 240 days. So we gotta get those animals acclimated 240 days before we're gonna have them feral. And uh, again, just need to get them into the right facilities and have time for that too prior to uh, them going in. If you're using electronic cell feeders, they gotta be trained before they get into the gestation. <clears throat> the typical vaccinations we'd be using would be Parvo I uh, should have had PCV2, PCV3, Ileitis, Salmonella, flu, uh, those are going to depend a little bit, and then the autogenous vaccines would be based upon some of the uh, specific farm issues that we'd be looking at. Some farms will use uh, E. coli, Clostridium rota, um, 
and do the preferring vaccination to the gilts to try and prime that immune system before they get into the herd, and the same thing with the autogenous vaccine. And we put together a vaccination schedule for the farm so that they can have that specifically spelled out and what the doses, dosages are and when to, to give those injections. <clears throat> and then working on uh, the uh, exposure to the farm microbiome or feedback uh, procedures, uh, fogging for the mycoplasma, you know, if we're doing serum exposure for PERS, you know, those are some of the things we do with uh, direct exposure back from the sow herd, so it's the sow herd source uh, to the farm. <clears throat> and remember that uh, one size does not fit all for acclimation. Uh, it's gotta be herd specific, and it's gonna depend upon the pathogens you have in the herd, the challenges you have in the herd, and it's gonna be like everything else, it's gonna evolve over time and gonna have to be, uh, continue to be changed and modified. And we have to monitor those procedures to make sure they're happening. Just because we do it doesn't mean it happens. Uh, so having a testing protocol, if you're doing a mycoplasma exposure, you wanna make sure they get exposed and you wanna make sure it's not too late. So whether you're doing that with oral fluids or serology, tracheal swabs, it's gonna depend again on the agents you're looking at and, um, and when you need to be looking at it. Again, having a good documented plan uh, that's continually updated and communicated with everyone on the, on the team is very important to make sure that we get that information done. So selection pressure. Uh, I, I think this is one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have in the industry today. Uh, I think it's always been a challenge. I don't think it's necessarily new today, but uh, again, <clears throat> do we keep too many uh, gilts back into the herd? Uh, what's the percentage? that we should be keeping into the herd. I see nobody's really, we, we'd be really unhappy if our genetic supplier told us they were keeping 90% of the gilts back, right? If we were purchasing gilts, we were pur purchasing the gilts and they told us they were selecting 90%, we'd be unhappy. Well, what happens when you have a GDU? I think I heard this morning that you're keeping 88%. We do the same. And I would tell you people that have an internal GDU, if they have three legs and two holes, uh, those sows are going back in the herd. And so that's one of the fallacies I think is, we'd be upset if we weren't somewhere in this 60 to 80% selection rate, but we keep 88 to 90% because they survived. And is this really right? Is that part of our problem? Is that one of our challenges we need to, to look at as we go forward? <clears throat> And uh, I'm glad we had the previous talk to talk about that phenotypic selection. Uh, you know, today we don't have uh, the kids that grew up with some of that phenotypic selection and learning some of that over the course of time. The 4-H the and FFA programs and the county fairs and participating in that and having that ability to be able to see those animals out there and, and make some of those uh, assessments. And so we've lost some of that art uh, in the system. And we looked here earlier as well with the leg structure. Again, we have, do we have the right animals? Uh, I put this down and, and trust me, I don't like trimming feet either, but uh, these are kind of forgotten tools. I think most of our young vets don't even know what these are, but, but <laughs> you know, we've, we've called those animals instead of correcting their, correcting their problems. And if you're gonna correct them, probably need to make it easier than what we used to do it. We didn't have that many to do. You know, you can make it easier, you can get a shoot. Uh, the Zinpro folks have done a nice job of demonstrating how that can be done and showing how uh, we can go in and make a difference and get some, keep some of these animals in the herd for a longer period of time. Body condition scoring is another important piece. Uh, and as we look at that, I think this becomes a, a really critical thing. And I think about it, we're at the Lehman Conference and early on in my career, I had the opportunity in a peer group to be in a gestation barn with Al Lehman, and we're, and so it's, it's so long ago, uh, Perry, that 24 pigs per mated female is a really good herd. And, um, and so Al was there with me and he goes, what do you see in this herd that's, that's different uh, than you see in most herds? And almost every sow was in ideal body condition. And th that left an indelible imprint on me of how important body condition is to performance, as well as longevity. And so again, 
whether we do the visual scoring, uh, whether we use the caliper tools, and I think the caliper tools are great tools for us uh, to help standardize that and make it easier to do. Again, we just gotta, I've been on farms that have calipers that do a poor job of condition, or do a poor job of scoring because they're not putting it in the right place. So again, it's just important that we execute that right. And uh, again, my talk is supposed to be on health, so I'm, I'm gonna come back I'm gonna come back to health too. So uh, again, biosecurity becomes the most important piece. And uh, as we talk about biosecurity, we talk about bioexclusion. And I think for certainly what we're talking about is the most important piece is um, I think to understand that, that the bioexclusion is how do we keep things out? Um, and that's certainly what you wanna make sure is that we don't get any new introductions into the herd. What we got, we got, but let's not get anything new into the herd. But the biocontainment piece, the forgotten part of biosecurity is probably just as important, particularly if we're acclimating to some of these pathogens in the GDU. If we're circulating disease out there, we don't want it circulating back into the sow herd, or we want those animals to be not shedding by the time they come back into the sow herd. So part of the biocontainment is making sure that we, uh, that we, we get it done in the GDU if we're doing it in the GDU. I put this slide in just for Again, the bio exclusion, you know, the replacement animals, the breeding stock are probably still the number one. Uh, there's all these other influences that we have on biosecurity and bio exclusion and keeping uh, disease out. The filtered farm, I put this in the, the, farm, in the, the farm in the bottle, so to speak, uh, as the filters. And I think the filters have added that next step. And uh, we've been able to see in some of these where we have been able to bring in, have uh, unfortunately have positive pigs in isolation, but keep them keep them, uh, get them off site and not infect the herd because we had the filters in place. So again, I think it's added a new dimension to our bio, uh, bio exclusion. So in summary, <clears throat> how do we make a more ro robust sow? As a veterinarian, I couldn't do this talk without saying keep disease out and, and biosecurity. It's still the most important piece. If we don't have those health challenges, life becomes a lot easier. Make sure the gilts are ready to enter the herd properly. Make sure they're acclimated from uh, the health standpoint as well as age and weight and uh, that they're acclimated to the facility that they're gonna be in. Again, how do we care for the sows in the herd? Uh, I like the idea of a retention specialist. I think we need to think about having some more people that are taking that on as a day-to-day -day, uh, thing that they're responsible for. Again, I think we gotta to continue to work and communicate with the genetic suppliers to help them understand our challenges. And uh, we gotta remember the lesson that Al taught me is make sure you keep the sows in the right body condition. So at the end of the day, again, I believe it is a battle that can be won. Uh, we've got some work to do, but we may have to deploy some new tactics to be able to uh, execute those numbers and get those numbers down more where we'd like them to be, especially the sow mortality side. And <clears throat> some of these problems aren't necessarily new. I went back to that 2004 talk and a lot of the slides are the same, same thing we're talking about today, uh, just a little different version. And I think we have to continue as an industry and as a group to challenge ourselves to continue to do better, particularly on the sow mortality side. That number uh, needs to be worked on for sure uh, as a whole industry. So with that, I'll uh, take some questions. Thank you very much, that was an excellent presentation. Do we have any questions in the? Thank you, Paul. Um, so Wayne Cast, many of you will know Dr. Cast, but in 2014 or 15, we were at World Pork Expo talking about PEDV and sow mortality and prolapse, right? And he said, um, he said he had an old professor that told him in graduate school that for a 50% selection rate, you have a set in place a 5% mortality associated with those females. And then he said, for a, a another to add another 25% to that so that you're at 75% uh, selection rate, you've probably got another 5% with that next 
percent cohort. So now we're at 10 percent mortality associated with 75 percent selection rate. And I think the data that we saw today bears that out, right? I mean, those are pretty pretty standard. And and since 2014 and 15 in PEDV, I firmly believe we have not had a properly sized guilt herd in the United States. Those females die at a higher rate. Not only that, but their offspring, if you were to if you were to track those females that were in that next 25% that shouldn't have been selected, their offspring die at a higher rate. I'll, I will almost bet you anything. So uh, I appreciate you putting that into your talk, and um, I'd be interested in any comments or feedback that you'd have rate relative to that. Yeah, and, and and it's easy for me to to stand up here and preach and say we got to do better, because I do think we do, and I do think selection rate's a key. Uh, I don't know how we disconnected those two things in the industry. I, I do know how we did it. It's we've got all the sunk cost in that guilt. Why don't we try and get a litter out of her? Yeah, and and breeding target is king. I think I heard that this morning, and we we say the same thing. Breeding target's king. Um, that's maybe a paradigm we need to challenge too. Is breeding target really right? Uh, yeah, it's right, but we got to make sure we're breeding the right females. Otherwise, the perform all the performance criteria is going to go down. If you're not breeding the right females your production is going down. Uh, the best herds make the best choices. They choose to breed their best animals. Uh, that's, that's why it works. And if you're not choosing the best animals, then, then you're gonna get a little bit of what you, what you chose. And so I, I think working on that, <clears throat> now I say that tongue in cheek, uh, because I think the biggest challenge is a lot of these GDUs uh, were sized for 50%, and we're trying to run 60% through them, so now we've got 15% extra gilt, and wonder why they don't do as well. You know, that's one thing that we've run into. And if I'm selecting my gilts, if I have an on-site GDU and I bring my gilts as wiener gilts, and I have to take them out back here, what happens if I'm short? I have no choice, I have to keep those animals. And so uh, there's some, challenge, some inherent challenges, and I think when we put together a lot of these GDUs and GDU flows, we didn't always calculate the selection rate. We didn't always calculate the proper uh, replacement rate. And so now we're stuck with a, a model that's a misfit. And, and so I, I think we have to go back and look at some of these and say, is there ways we can adapt these? Can we bring it a little dif different age and help ourselves out? Uh, now, I, I, now I'm worried about we're moving to gilts at the wrong time, and <laughs> and so maybe we're going to have to rethink that a little bit, or or we're going to have to be wrap them in bubble wrap first, I guess, uh, and make sure they get a chance to recover. <clears throat> but uh, I, I do think it's a it's an important issue, and, and it's a part of the. It, it's been an evolution that way too. We've, we've gone to uh, having more on-site GDUs to help stabilize the health, to do what we need to do, uh, but then also then you're locked in with the numbers and you don't really have a lot of choices. And I think that's part of where we get, we get ourselves uh, kind of in a disconnect. Yep. Uh, the, the comment was seasonality is playing an impact on the supply. Um, and uh, early in my career, um, I, I tell this to the young vets, early in my career when we had all the sows outside, seasonality was a big thing. I mean, it was 20%. It was like, holy cow, if you're not planned ahead for that. Now today with uh, some of the changes we've made, that's much less of an impact, but there's still an impact. And uh, that can certainly affect that as well. But it certainly reduced dramatically with uh, you know better evaporative cooling, uh, time blighting, all those things have helped to reduce uh, what we would have had back when we were in the Cargill. So just uh, in, it, this is a great discussion, no question. Uh, I, I would say we should maybe the word some of the things different when we say re uh, retention. I think we're missing, uh, and you kind of mentioned, you know, I would like more refer to voluntary cool. <laughs> I mean, what we are not doing here, what, where we are having less room is for the yeah. voluntary cools, whether it's because yeah. mortality, and, and in our case, in the database that we show, we, we saw the clear opportunity in the repro area on the mm -hmm. non-voluntary, you know, like a, 
no heat or, you know, mm -hmm. I think what I'm trying to picture or say with the database we have, we can predict. If we can predict what, what to don't breed, we can do better decision of that things. I think we are not, I, I, I don't want to argue the execution sometimes, you know, but I think we are pretty beyond in our system, at least the people, we breed animals to date farrow. We don't breed three legs, we don't breed, you know, <laughs> 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 even if the breeding target yeah. is the king, we kind of outdid that kind of things. Yep. So there is more the things that we can't see. You know, when we face the, the silent hit, the, the, that was the only time that I think we forced a little bit, uh, because what else you do? I mean, we, we couldn't, you know, do much when we have 50% of our system with that problem. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I, again, I would like to, uh, the concept of vol voluntary cools is the one that we need to enhance in order to keep the parity structure. No, I, I appreciate those comments, and um, I was joking a little bit about the three legs, but uh, <laughs> at least two, yeah. But um, the, I, I do think that uh, the voluntary culls is where we have to get to to get that higher production. And uh, that's what bothered me when I looked at that uh, r removal analysis is the old age should be a high percentage of culls. And it's being driven down to uh, accommodate the mortality and the spin out of the early, early period animals. And that's the high cost to the industry. And if we're bringing a lot of these young gilts in, and we didn't even talk today about the bigger impact is the health status of the downstream flow. If you continue to spin these young animals through and we've got all these animals coming through and they're shedding more organisms in the system, it's not gonna be as much fun downstream. If we can get that right, that's gonna to help to stabilize these herds, it's gonna give you a better flow. And that's a whole, different, whole nother discussion, but uh, Jenny only gave me a 45 minutes. <laughs> We'll take one more question before lunch. Yeah, um, Pedro Riolo, University of Minnesota. And um, first comment, I, I, I think that spoken, speaking for Mike Broom, out of feed events, sometimes we undermine the effect of those out of feed events on, on animal performance. And I was wondering also subsequent sow uh, performance. But beyond that comment, um, I was wondering how do we enhance observation of, on the animals and what do we measure? Because it seems that, you know, following uh, Francisco's presentation, there are some some events that we call, e even with prolapses and, and, and we have sudden death of sows, right? Those are things that we cannot explain how they happen. In Dr. Carlson's presentation, you see the OCD, that's the outcome that you see was something that happened early in the life of the animal that you didn't record. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we have, disease or, or we uh, 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 intentionally uh, uh, pathogen uh, exposure. Maybe on top of that, we have uh, out of feed event. And then independently, those events may not have been a problem. The animal may have coped with those, no problem. But when we put them on top, maybe it's an antagonistic effect where now it's a train wreck and you have maybe a bunch of animals that will not cope with that additional stress. So I wonder, what do we need to measure? What do we need to observe in the animals that we are missing? I was wondering, you know, is it sometimes failure to follow the SOP, for example, one thing that we need to be tracking and, and those, instead of saying, okay, we, we are gonna track the prolapses, we're gonna track the animals that we see lame. Maybe we should track instances where we didn't follow what we should have done and that being our KPI. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, and I think a good and fair comment. Um, you know, what we, what we tend to focus on is that end result. How, how many gilts did we get to P3? Uh, how many gilts did we get to voluntary cull because they were old sows? And there's better sows to replace them. Uh, and ultimately, uh, as we talk about that end goal, we have to figure out what are those components that are not giving us what we want at the end. And unfortunately today our KPIs have been more about the end goal. And uh, although the end goal is still good and it still gives us something to look at, there's probably some breakdown things that we can look at in between there to help us achieve that final, final goal. 
Thank you very much, then, and please help me thank, again, Dr. Rusty. Sure.